Welcome, everyone. I'm Robert Wolanski, the Director of Communications here at Heritage Auctions, and I'm very glad to welcome you to the State of the U.S. Coins Market Discussion with my good friend, my colleague, and a very, very dapper gentleman, Todd Imhoff, the Executive Vice President here at Heritage Auctions. Hello, Todd. Hi, everybody. Robert, thank you for having me. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays, indeed. It's uh, here's, here's our week before Christmas gift to everyone an hour-long discussion about uh, some of the most beautiful and rarest and expensive coins that uh, this country or this world has to offer. If you have a question for Todd throughout this, please feel free to uh, drop it here. Tommy Noel, who's capably and ably directing us from behind the scenes, will pop it up and Todd will get to it if you want to ask it anonymously. Feel free to send it to tommyn at ha.com, as you see in the scroll down there. And we'll also get to it. Uh, I know there are several folks who are waiting long before we even popped on the screen. So if you have a question for us, we are certainly eager to get to it. That's why Todd's here. It's not very often that anyone from anywhere gets to ask a question of the, one of the uh, the head guys here at Heritage, one of the uh, the men who, man who knows everything about anything related to U.S. coins. Uh, Terry Schaff here says, I will listen to anything this man has to say, which is an awful good way to begin this particular conversation. So, Todd, let's get to it. Um, we'll discuss a few moments, uh, some highlights from the last year, and we'll look forward to fun coming up in January. But I did want to ask you, what has been, you know, every one of these state of the market discussions I've done throughout our 40 plus categories, we all talk about how the last year and a half has reshaped every single category at Heritage. Certainly in March of 2020, no one knew what to expect in terms of how the markets would perform. You know, everyone was sort of holding their breath and tightening their belts at the same time. And yet we have certainly seen some extraordinary results beginning in January of this year. And Tommy, if you want to go ahead and pull that up, we can start talking about that. But let's talk about what you've seen over the last year and a half and certainly over the last year. Well, you're asking a question that everyone's uh, talking about these days. Um, when my partners and I were sitting around uh, uh, in April of 2020, when the pandemic was right, uh, right starting to shut things down, uh, we all sort of looked at each other and asked, does anyone have a playbook for this? And, uh, and we didn't, and we were deeply concerned about how this was going to affect business. And, um, and we just, instinctively thought that we were going to have to really tighten our belts, to, uh, as you pointed out, and we're going to have to change things. But literally within weeks, if not a couple of months, it became incredibly clear that not only was uh, was our business going to be OK, but that these markets were starting to suddenly see this new infusion of, uh, of people uh, that were collecting again. And there's there's a multitude of reasons that we probably saw that happening. And it was just a great, pleasant surprise. And it allowed us to accomplish a lot. It allowed us to keep uh, uh, not only keep our current staff and employees, but I think we've added close to 200 new people in, in the last year and a half. Uh, as you pointed out, rare coins, I think everyone knows numismatics is still by far our largest category here at Heritage. But we're really fortunate to be involved in 40 some other categories and really all of which have seen this, uh, this kind of bull market happening. And it's been really special and wonderful to see. Let's get to some of those reasons. Certainly, you know, just yesterday, we had a documentary crew in here talking to uh, Chris Ivey, the founder of our sports division, about the boom in sports cards over the last year and a half. And we can certainly point to, oh, the last dance when it began airing on ESPN and the uh, incredible boost that it saw to the 86 Fleer Jordan rookie and a near mint 10. But there's less of a specific thing one can point to when it comes to coins, perhaps as an investment, perhaps as a, 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 a falling one falling back into a hobby that one might have begun years ago and, and left the side and come back to during the pandemic. But certainly that explains only so far. So when you talk about and think about and discuss with the uh, the ownership here, your fellow partners here about what has led to this boom in the price of coins and the, the the collectability of the many of them have become incredibly coveted over the last year and a half. What are the, some of the reasons that you guys discuss? Well, 
rare coins have some distinct advantages over really every other area of collecting, whether it's fine art, comic books, uh, manuscripts, movie posters, uh, antiques. And, and the first among those is the liquidity or the lack of uh, the lack of friction that we have in trading rare coins. Uh, commissions are much smaller on coins. People can buy and sell with uh, uh, on uh, uh, with a tighter what we call fungibility or tighter buy sell spreads than you can in other collectibles. Coins are small; they're portable. There's a lot of logistical reasons for that, and it's just a real flourishing marketplace. So that's always been an advantage to numismatics over a lot of the other collecting areas. Um, but there's some real economic purely economic factors that are affecting rare coins specifically. Uh, of course, when I talk about rare coins, we're talking about a huge marketplace. Uh, so for purposes of answering your question, Robert, it's um, I really take rare coins, numismatics, and put them into three tranches, if you will. There's what I call the generic areas, which are more precious metal related coins. Uh, uh, the more common date, lower grades in $20 gold pieces or silver, uh, common date silver dollars, things that we buy and sell here at Heritage in large quantities uh, every day, and that investors and collectors uh, will, will buy. Right. Uh, the second group is, uh, well, let me jump to the third group, and that's the ultra trophy coins, which is what we're going to get into here in a little bit, talking about what we saw in the last year and what we have coming up next month in the uh, fund sale. Uh, are the real expensive pieces. And then there's everything in between, um, uh, collector coins that are hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, even tens of thousands of dollars. So there's these three tranches. So when we take that first tranche, generic coinage, we're seeing real eco greater economic factors pushing those prices up. There's the threat of inflation that we're seeing right now. We're seeing a rise in precious metal prices in the last year and a half, approximately 1,400 to now. Uh, I believe it was over 1800 today. Right. Uh, so we've seen that move and that's boosting up demand and uh, the prices for generic coins. Um, the, uh, and it's, so there's again, demand from people that are more purely investors uh, looking for a hedge against possible inflation. Uh, the, if I jump ahead, well, let me talk about just, we'll go to the middle coins, uh, what I call the middle tier coins next. Yeah, because I can't wait to show off the high-end trophy coins here in a moment. Sure, so we'll do that. So what's driving the middle coin market is we're seeing for the first time in a really long time this infusion of new clients um, uh, that are coming at people. We've always been concerned here at Heritage and Numismatics about what we call an aging demographic, and that is that we're, we're not seeing the younger generations having the same interest in rare coins as my generation, older generations have had. And uh, that's been a concern of ours for the longevity and the health of the rare coin market. So for the first time in many, many years, if not arguably decades now, uh, we're seeing an infusion of new, new, new blood into the marketplace. That's been great. And typically new blood doesn't go right to the trophy coins. They go to more, uh, uh, more regular issue coins that are all great and interesting pieces, but they don't necessarily step up and buy a coin for a hundred thousand um, dollars. Secondly, we're seeing the existing clients because of this strong economy that we're in right now. People are seeing their equity portfolios, their real estate holdings, other they're all employed, right? Most people uh, in this kind of a uh, in this in this economy. So we're seeing people spending more money. The existing clients feel more comfortable uh, uh, spending money to add to their collections, fill in that hole that they need. Um, and then I want, to back, I want to back up one thing. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm fascinated by something you just said, which is the, the infusion of younger buyers into the marketplace, which I assume a takes you by surprise. But I'm also curious, what do you think accounts for that? OK, so great question. And it allows me to clarify what I just said, because in a way I just misspoke. What we're seeing is this increase in new clients, unfortunately based on what we can tell, it's not like we uh, we know the ages of all of our clients, Robert. Right? Right. Uh, uh, I'm not necessarily seeing younger blood coming into the marketplace. Yeah. Now there are some, okay, uh, some younger people that's been great to see, but as from what I've been able to ascertain, this new infusion, these this all these new clients that are registering at Heritage to bid in our auctions are, uh, 
are also my generation or older generation people. There's just more of them, people that we haven't done business with before right. uh, that are coming out of nowhere and uh, registering to bid. Uh, so they're not necessarily younger, although, of course, there are some. But is it a diversification of interest? Because certainly, you know, I've been here almost two years. Um, I, I was always told that comic buyers buy comic books, baseball card buyers buy baseball cards, coin buyers buy coins. But I've also been told that over the last year, we've certainly seen coin buyers gravitate to comics, baseball card collectors gravitate toward rare coins. Have you seen that that is a significant impact as well? We talk about this once in a while. It's interesting how certain categories of collecting, the demographic or the type of person that collects, find themselves collecting not just, well, rare coin, take a rare coin collection collector. It's really unusual for me to find a rare coin collector that doesn't also collect something else. It might be timepieces, it might be comic books, it might be, uh, it might be cars, uh, uh, whatever they're into. Other collecting categories, um, not necessarily the case. Uh, people that we see collecting very rare fine art, expensive art, they don't necessarily gravitate towards other collectible items. Uh, they tend to focus mostly just on art. Um, but it, baseball card collectors, uh, timepiece collectors, rare wine collectors, for whatever reason, rare wine collectors. Uh, I don't think I've ever met a rare a collector of really rare wines that doesn't collect something else. Uh, it's just, and again, certain categories of collecting lend themselves to that. Uh, and so at Heritage, we really benefit from that because of our cross marketing, uh, our ability to somebody who's interested in, in, uh, in collecting Civil War era coinage, for example, well, we make sure that they are aware that we have a Civil War Americana historical collection coming up where they might be able to buy a Confederate uniform or or the diary of a Union soldier or a, or a firearm or a, or a sword from that era. Uh, these kind of things appeal to people across, you know, uh, across the, the scope of all these different areas. You know, I well, throughout the course of this conversation, I do want to get with you about sort of what led you to this. But I do want to start talking about some of the coins we've sold throughout this year and look ahead to next year. Tommy, if you don't mind, let's bring up uh, a, a how we began 2021. <clears throat> Obviously, this is uh, one of the most significant American coins and certainly a $9.36 million sale is one of the most significant in heritage history. Were you surprised by how well this did to begin 2021? Yeah, I was surprised by two, by two things. Um, certainly the price exceeded even our 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 most optimistic estimate uh, going into uh, going into this auction. I mean, we anticipated it somewhere in the five to seven range easily. We knew it was going to be a very expensive coin. We had sold one via private sale, a slightly lesser quality piece um, uh, for uh, uh, over five million, and so we anticipated that it would go. But two things surprised us: one, of course, the price, and b, uh, the number of people that were. And this should have been an indication for the rest of the year. It wasn't just two guys; there were three or four people all over, uh, or four or five people all over six million uh, to seven million in value that pushed this price up. Uh, it wasn't just two guys going back and forth. Uh, because we had so many different bidders, that tells us when we're looking at that, uh, how uh, uh, how widespread demand is and how strong it is. You know, it's extraordinary. <clears throat> I knew very little bit, very little about numismatics when I got here. Comic books, baseball cards, could talk about them all day. But I have fallen in love with the history that these coins tell. Certainly the Brazier Doubloon is one of the most iconic and most important coins in American history. I assume that that has a significant part in how well it does. Certainly how beautiful it is, its provenance also impacts it. But I am curious, as the bidders, as you, as you say, and it was more than two, began to fight over it, I, I do wonder if there are discussions afterwards about why, about, you know, certainly... To, to have a trophy coin like this is certainly something that any great collector wants to boast about having. And I'm certainly curious about what it is that they want, why they want it. Um, you know, you, you know the winner, certainly. Talk to me a little bit about why it went for so much. 
Well, this particular coin is one of the most storied and historically important coins in the, in the history of numismatics. It's really what it was the, uh, the first um, uh, sort of gold coin specifically mint or specifically struck, um, uh, hoping that this was going to represent the new United States coinage. Uh, it's a, there's a rich history to it. But really, the question that you're asking um, why people collect rare coins or why are they drawn to something as magnificent as a Brasher de Bloom? What's great about rare coinage and really about all historical collectibles is there's really something for, there are coins that tell stories, Robert, uh, about, uh, no, they don't have to be trophy coins. There are lots of fairly inexpensive coins that you can buy that are historically fascinating when you know their, their background, the, the silver dollars and, uh, and uh, what we were doing when we were uh, uh, just founding, founding this country and trying to introduce new coinage to the rest of the world. Uh, there are price points that are available to anybody. We know how many coins were struck. The Mint took pretty good records. And because of PCGS and NGC, we've got a really good idea of how many in the census, how many exist in a certain condition. But ultimately, what really makes uh, uh, people drawn to the rare coins is the story that that particular coin has uh, and why it's important to them. It might be something that's personal to them. Uh, maybe they uh, had a grandfather that immigrated to the United States in the late 18, uh, 1800s. Uh, so that era of coinage appeals to them, or it might be real trophy coins, uh, early, uh, uh, early pieces. Sorry, I just had a little bit of a power thing. I don't know if my lighting here is affecting I think if you don't move, uh, but I have to say, it's a dramatic, beautiful work of lighting. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how it happened, but it did. Uh, I'll stick with it if it's all right. I think in the office, if you don't move, uh, stand up after a few minutes, um, you get a little bit of a power saver effect. Yes, uh, that's I have to say, you're illuminated beautifully. Thank you, Robert. So let's talk about because obviously we, we followed January with the 1861 $20 packet that sold for over $7 million. And, and like the Brazier de Bloom, it is the finest known example. Um, certainly whenever a finest known example comes to market, um, I assume that you're aware of the fact that this is going to spark a, a heated bidding. And that was the case here as well, correct? Yes, it was. Now this particular coin and a couple of the other coins in, in this sale really marked, um, really marked, I don't know how to say this. Um, this was the first uh, first sale of this coin and a couple of other coins in this sale where there were the emergence of two or three brand new bidders with incredibly deep pockets. Um, going into this sale, I'm usually pretty good at knowing. You, you present <laughs> with any coin that we're being offered next month or this month. Um, I could pretty much tell you who the three most likely bidders will be on a certain coin. I may not know exactly who's going to win, but I know who's going to be the final two or three uh, bidders on uh, on these kind of coins. It's, it's what I do. Uh, this sale and the sale of this coin and a few of the others was the first time where we saw some brand new blood uh, that I'm, where we're looking at each other going, I'm sorry, who was it that bought this? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, is this legit? You know, all, all these things that were happening. And, uh, in fairness, that goes back actually to uh, a Sotheby's sale. Uh, they sold a single gold coin, the 1933-20, for uh, a staggering price of nearly uh, $20 million, which set a new world record. And the fact that that did not sell to one of those two, three, four usual suspects, if you will, uh, uh, that was really what put us on notice that there's some brand new people uh, involved in collecting trophy coins, uh, rare coins. And then we saw that spill into our sales uh, uh, shortly thereafter with the sale of that $20 piece and uh, the Pack 20 and also uh, the $1794 from the Simpson collection. Uh, that coin, Mr. Simpson had only purchased uh, a year and a half or so ahead of before that. Yes, thank you uh, for pulling that up. Uh, Mr. Simpson purchased this coin for a little under $5 million, which was a, considered to be a really strong price at the time. Uh, and so we were uh, not necessarily concerned, but we were all kind of wondering how much has this market uh, strengthened in just the last year and a half. And sure enough, it ends up selling for, uh, I believe, over what, 6.5, 6.6 .6 million? Six, yeah. Six, yeah. 
yeah, 6.6 6 million. Uh, so really a staggering price. And it, it was a great barometer for us to uh, be able to show as a real solid example of short term appreciation and how this marketplace has changed since the pandemic and during the pandemic. But even then, so when you see that Sotheby's sale and you see the results and you see new people coming in, you're certainly aware of, you're expectant of, you certainly can still be surprised by. So when a coin like this sells for 1.6 million over what Bob had paid for it uh, even a year ago, does that begin to completely recalculate or reconfigure uh, your expectations of an understanding of this market and this hobby that you have known your entire life? Yeah, it does. Um it just shows how really sensitive supply and demand is in a category like rare coins. And although in fairness, okay, so we're really talking about in these cases, Robert, uh, these trophy coins. These are the, these are the Rembrandts, the Picassos, the de Kooning, uh, bacon paintings uh, right. uh, of our, of our little world. Okay. And so just because one coin brings $10 million, $20 million, $5 million, um, the bigger questions that we're asking ourselves all the time is how does that affect the other 99.9% of collectors, right? Um, which is those coins get all the headlines, but the bread and butter for our business here at heritage and for the rare coin marketplace in general are those coins that don't sell for millions of dollars. Right. And, um, and we were starting to talk about really what's, uh, what's driving the prices upward in all rare coins, not just at the trophy level, but in the in the uh, less expensive coins too. We're getting this effect where the trophy, the, the results on the trophy coins are pulling up uh, all sort of a rising tide uh, raises all boats. We're seeing that effect. There's no question about it. It gets headlines. It gets people more interested, more confident. Um, hey, somebody out there just bought a coin for $7 million. I can I can step up and buy this coin for seven thousand dollars or seventy thousand dollars, you know. Um, this gives confidence to the marketplace, but then you're also so you're getting pulled up by the trophy coins, but the marketplace is also being pushed up by the generic market, by the precious metal markets uh, that we're seeing people that are inflation sensitive. You know, historically, numismatics has been a good place to be um, as a hedge against inflation. That said, it's been forty years in this country since we've seen any sort of a threat of higher inflation. Um, so we're going off of something that happened 40 years ago and thinking that, okay, it's probably going to perform well again uh, if we do, in fact, see uh, inflation longer term. Well, you know, it's fascinating because it is very much, it, we see this sort of echo throughout the categories. Certainly if, when a 52 mantle uh, sells for a higher price than it ever has before or a uh, T206 Honus Wagner, you know, an authentic, not a, not a PSA three, but an authentic, just one that is clearly the thing can sell for two and a half million dollars. Uh, it certainly begins to impact everything just beneath it. You know, a 52 mantle that might have sold for ten, twenty thousand dollars a few years ago. Chris Ivey was saying just yesterday now sells for four five, six, seven, eight times that only a year and a half later. So it certainly is um, something that runs throughout the categories in the last couple of years. Yeah, in some of these marketplaces, you can't help but look at them and think that it's sort of frothy. Um, what we really like about numismatics uh, uh, and rare coins is that it's it's a very healthy market overall. It's not just one guy bull in a china shop that's simply buying everything. We're seeing uh, much more grassroots demand. Um, again, getting away from the trophy coins, but uh, and if you're just looking at just the regular marketplaces. Um, uh, it's it's real demand. It's not just one guy wreaking havoc. Um, we're seeing uh, everything from this infusion of new people to existing people uh, that are feeling very comfortable uh, in their purchases. I do want to touch on one last trophy coin before we move on to fun and some things that aren't necessarily trophy coins, although there is something in fun that is one of the definitions of trophy. I want to talk about the 1907 Ultra High Relief $20 uh, that sold. Uh, this sold in 2007 for $1.84 million. When I asked you why you wanted to talk about this one, obviously there's a very specific reason, and it's not to do necessarily with an auction of this coin. No. Uh, 
so I selected this coin sort of as a bookend. We started out the year, like I said, with uh, uh, the Brasher doubloon setting a, a, such an incredibly high record price. And then uh, this particular coin, I pulled it up. We sold this coin, like you said, in 2007 for a little over $1.8 million. And uh, we sold this coin literally just last week in a private sale uh, for nearly $5 million. Uh, 4.75 million uh, was the exact price. And uh, that surpassed a previous world record for this coin that we set in an auction for $3.6 million, I believe in, uh, um, I believe it was May uh, of this year uh, for a coin in the same grade. So just 3.6 million to 4.7, over a million dollars different in literally a few months time uh, for a, a very comparable uh, coin, uh, a, a trophy coin, of course. But, uh, and this one went via private sale, uh, not even via auction. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it really just shows that the marketplace continues to be strong here uh, throughout the end of the year in the final days. Do you get a lot of demand? Do you, do you have a lot of folks coming to you and saying, all right, look, I want to buy this particular coin. It's not an auction. I know you've sold it. And certainly we have the buy now function or buy from owner function. But I assume given the way the market has performed in the last couple of years, that there are folks coming to you and saying, how do I get my hands on this particular coin? Well, th there are. So <clears throat> all of you watching uh, and as Heritage is primarily known for our auctions. It's uh, where we do by far our greatest volume. We'll do, you know, um, over you know a billion dollars in auction sales this year. But what few people uh, are, or often people are surprised to hear that we'll do hundreds of millions of dollars every year in in private sales as well. And these are people, to your point, Robert, that that are looking. We we know specifically what they're looking for. They come to my trading group, uh, our wholesale traders. And they let us know, hey, I'm, I need these three dates to complete this set. I'm looking for this particular rarity. You know, if anything comes around. And our buyers are at every major coin show still. Uh, even during the pandemic, these guys were on the road uh, uh, visiting with clients. And uh, certainly our shipments of, from Federal Express and Brinks increased a lot over the last year uh, since we weren't traveling quite as much as we were. But we're buying and selling. Uh, uh, in private sales all the time as well. And uh, it's a side uh, or a very effective way of buying and selling coins sometimes, uh, uh, not just the auction. So let's go from talking about the year that was to the year that will be. January 5th through 10th, fun happens in Orlando. Um, first time in, in a, in certainly it had, didn't have it last year, correct? Uh, correct. Not in person. We conducted the sale uh, uh, here in our uh, new corporate headquarters. Previews will take place in Orlando at the begin, uh, beginning of January. How excited are you to get back on the road for these uh, these events? Well, we all are. Um, collectors are a social group. They like sharing their stories. They like seeing each other. They like uh, seeing touching things in hand. And they like showing their stuff off, right? Absolutely. And uh, and so people that attend these shows and display their wares in these trade shows. It's always, it's been an important part of, uh, of numismatics uh, uh, for many generations, for decades. And, uh, uh, and so we've really missed that uh, during the pandemic. Uh, people, it was an element of our marketplace that was essentially eliminated for 18 months. Our first big foray back in that was the uh, ANA convention in Chicago in August. And uh, that turned out to be a great success. We, we ended up conducting lot viewing there, but we held the sale back in uh, back in Dallas in, at the headquarters. This will be the first really big auction whereby we're conducting lot viewing in conjunction with the major show, in-person show, um, as well as the actual live auction. Right. So, you know, I love the fact that you wanted to discuss um, fun but you didn't begin this particular discussion using a trophy coin, even though this is the uh, 1870 half dollar, um, certainly one of the best known examples, the rarest mint issue of denomination. Uh, it's one of my favorite coins in the auction because so far at least it's one that I can afford. Well, <laughs> um, your budget uh, is still going to have to be probably pretty significant. I know, I know. I look at the two hundred ten dollars and go, <laughs> "Yeah, I can get that," and then I'm realizing, "Oh, we're three weeks away." Right. So, 
uh, starting out the uh, the auction, I don't know if this is this actually might even be the first uh, standalone sale that's going to kick off the fun sale, uh, the fun show. <clears throat> this is a specialty uh, collection, standalone catalog. Uh, called the Ryan's Bequest Collection. And it's uh, an amazing collection of Carson City coinage. Uh, the collection's worth you know, approximately $2 million or so. And it, I pulled out uh, a handful of the, one of the more coveted dates in the, in the Carson City coinage series uh, or is 1870. So the seated 50 cent piece, the uh, $5 gold piece, the uh, uh, $10 gold piece in this sale are all really fabulous coins uh, from and uh, terrific representatives. Some of them, there are three of the most special coins that are part of the Ryan Bequest collection. And uh, and we, we expect some pretty spirited bidding on these. The 1870 $10 and $5 gold pieces, uh, <clears throat> talking about some of the great records that we set last year, n really none of them were as stunning or more stunning than, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe we have a slide of this, but we sold an 1870, uh, one of the two finest uh, 1870 uh, CC $20 Liberty gold pieces and uh, sold for a record price of over $1.6 million. Right. Our, our pre-sale estimate on that coin was more like uh, seven to 800,000. So literally more than blew past our estimate, uh, optimistic estimate and set a, an another amazing world record. Uh, Carson city coinage has always been popular. So that's hardly surprising, but, uh, and the age of so now say again, Robert, is the Carson City mintage, is, is that more so popular? I've certainly uh, heard folks around here discuss it more in the last few months than in the last couple of years, throughout the last well, year, couple of years I've been here. Yeah, no, good, good question. Carson City coinage has always been popular in one of the uh, uh, one of the areas that num uh, numismatists and, collector, uh, and collectors uh, will focus on. But we've seen uh, prices in the Carson City coinage area uh, be very strong compared to New Orleans Mint or other branch mint uh, areas outside of Philadelphia. Uh, Carson City Coinage has enjoyed a pretty good run here for a while, uh, the last few years with increasing prices and increased demand. Tommy, I think there was a question that uh, came up right before we jumped into fun. I want to make sure we don't miss that from Charlie Black. Which day or days are the Buffalo Bayou Pioneer Gold Coins being auctioned at fun? I'm sorry. The, I, I'm familiar with the Buffalo Bayou collection, of course. But what's the what's the question, Charlie? What days are they being auctioned uh, at the uh, during the the fun show? Do you know particular? No, you know I'm embarrassed to tell you. I can't remember offhand, but I'm almost positive the blue uh, the Buffalo Bayou collection is being uh, sold in conjunction or as part of the Platinum Night Sale, which would be Friday um, Friday evening, and it's going to be in that catalog as well as other areas of the catalog too. Um, obviously, the most expensive coins would be in the Platinum Night, and that would be uh, for that uh, that Friday evening of fun. Right. Um, and uh, I think right after the Arizona, I can't, I'm trying to remember now if, um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely going to be Friday night, Charlie. And I can, for all the obvious reasons, I know why you'd be focused on that. Uh, I will that say this, Charlie, you know how to get a hold of Todd. So if you uh, want specific questions or anybody, Todd. Good. It's a good segue. Todd at HA.com is how folks get a hold of you if they have a question. Yeah, uh, if, uh, that uh, that uh, Buffalo Bayou collection of territorial coins is absolutely fabulous. Um, it's in a territorial coinage is a uh, pretty sophisticated area of numismatics. It requires a kind of a higher level of education uh, and uh, in research to really understand the rarity and the appeal of these coins. Uh, the quality on most of these type of coins uh, are usually lower, but they're all just super rare, intrinsically rare. And uh, uh, thanks for bringing that up. But there's some uh, there's some amazing coins in that collection, like uh, uh, Oregon uh, territorial pieces, the Beavers. Uh, uh, I mean, really remarkable rarities in there. I want to talk. Speaking of rarities, I really want to talk about the 1793 Chain America scent, which is uh, in fun. It's tied for the second finest in the census. Um, these are the kind of things that really bring me to numismatics in a way that as a comic collector, as a, as a, I don't know, as someone who did not know much about coins, other than the fact that my father collected them and really enjoyed having them um, in, a, in a very reasonable small amount for, for, for an auto parts salesman. Um, I'm fascinated by this particular coin. I want you to tell me a little bit more about it. All right. Well, Going back to your uh, uh, earlier good question about 
uh, people that buy stories and people that are attracted to the history of coins. There's really nothing more historically important and historically interesting than the very, very first coins that were ever struck in the United States. And uh, the early copper uh, copper pieces, half cents, and this uh, 1793 pieces, uh, the chain and wreath varieties, uh, are, I mean, it's just, it, they should be prized coins in really everyone's collection uh, that really wants to span numismatics. These are among the very first coins ever struck. Uh, for general circulation in the new uh, in the newly formed United States, uh, they're always in demand. This particular collector and this particular coin, what's really terrific about it? This uh, what is it? It's the Arizona collection, um, and it's all uh, early large cents. And uh, this collector who wants to remain anonymous uh, is a really savvy guy, and these coins he really over the over the many years. He would buy coins primarily. Let me digress. Sorry. Um, Tom, most, let me just say this. Let me just say this. All the digression you would like to do, you are <laughs> certainly free to do. Folks who are listening want, want to hear from you. Reminding folks, you have about 20 minutes or so to ask Todd a question. You don't get this opportunity often, so feel free to ask it here. But well, it's easy, for me to, uh, it's easy for me to get excited about all these different coins. And what's really wonderful about next month's sales is it really does span the gambit of uh, earliest cents uh, or colonial issues from like Alan Weinberg uh, to uh, uh, early cents from uh, the Arizona collection to major territorial pieces. It really has something for everyone. What I was going to say about this Arizona collection is the collector here um, really waited and bought great coins from every other famous collection of early large cents. So the vast majority of the coins in this Arizona collection came from other great collections, Eliasburg, uh, Huzak, um, uh, Huzak, um, uh, Nafs uh, Nafsker, uh, just lots of Nafsinger, excuse me. Uh, all these uh, really amazing collections that were put together by other savvy connoisseurs of, uh, of numismatics. And uh, so people buying out of this collection are, are getting some really rich uh, pedigrees, uh, not just from the Arizona collection, but uh, for centuries before. Well, you know what? I want to talk about the territorials because I want to talk about the 1849 $10 organ exchange, sure. um, which is in fun. I'm fascinated by these territorials. I know very little about them other than the fact that uh, they're incredibly special. So, I have, is there a different kind of collector for, I don't know, let's say a, a, a Brazier de Bloom in any condition as there is for something like this, which is, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's a more niche coin necessarily, but certainly it's, uh, I'm fascinated by the story that these particular coins have to tell. Well, it's really the story of the wild, wild west. Yeah. So what, what is it more storied than that when it comes to, you know, the, the prospectors that all headed out to California and made their way out west, uh, hoping to uh, strike gold. Well, <clears throat> there was demand for uh, uh, coiners and minters and assayers at the time. So all these various uh, uh, territorial mints uh, came up and started striking, uh, taking gold dust and uh, uh, and started striking coins uh, that would uh, form as some sort of a circulating currency at the time. So. To answer your question about who collects these things, yes, it's a niche area, but it's really not that much more niche than any other area of numismatics if you're going to focus on commemorative issues or, or early copper issues. Um, really, what's great about numismatics is that it, uh, there's so many different ways to go and everyone's passionate about their particular area. Um, territorial coins, as interesting as they are historically, um, uh, it's people that gravitate towards that may have uh, prior to that started collecting $20 gold pieces and then found out that during the, during that time, uh, all these uh, gold coins were being minted out West uh, through branch mints and territorial issues. Uh, so it's fun. What I love about those are the one, those are the coins I always imagine in any Western, when a, a, a guy is paid in a bag full of coins that these are the coins that they were paid with. Um, they were, and they used them for circulation. A lot of it was business to business then, uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of uh, what's one of the things attributes, I guess, of territorial coinage is quality. It's nearly impossible to find territorial coinage in uncirculated condition. Uh, that's very difficult. You're talking about uh, 
uh, miners, prospector, you know, uh, kind of crude methods of coining uh, back then. Uh, based on today, uh, today's measures. And these things are shoveled around. I mean, there really wasn't a lot of attention paid towards taking care of these coins. Uh, they literally jingled around in pockets. They banged around in boxes. They were shipped around, uh, uh, around the world in, in freight, you know, in wooden freighters. And uh, they picked up a lot of wear. And they were thrown down in gold bags, the uh, cowboys who were paid in, uh, in territorial coins. Before we get to Larry's question here, I want to, speaking of the gold rush, speaking of uh, gold dust that's assayed into a uh, hard currency, one of my favorite things in this uh, auction, uh, I've gotten to spend a little time with it, writing about it, thinking about it, and reading a great deal about the uh, SS Central America, which sunk in September 1857 off the, uh, on the East Coast. Um, this Justin Hunter gold ingot, which is the largest Justin Hunter that was uh, recovered in 1988, 87, 88 by uh, Tommy Thompson. Uh, that's an incredible story all on its own. Somebody asked me yesterday, what's the estimate on it? And I said, I don't know, because I don't think we've ever sold anything remotely like this. Certainly we have sold gold ingots from the, uh, the ship of gold, as it was known. But to see something like this, to see something that weighs 54 pounds, but feels like it weighs a thousand uh, is truly remarkable. <laughs> yeah, if anybody ever gets a chance to pick up a large brick like this, it's uh, it's really a surreal experience. Uh, your write up, by the way, on the uh, press release on this coin, or I'm sorry, on this ingot was uh, was really remarkable, Robert. Uh, well done on that. Thank you. Um, I thought it was uh, uh, really informative and exciting. This this ingot, as you pointed out, is uh, the largest bar uh, ever manufactured by Just Justin Hunter. But it, I believe it's the second largest, uh, only to a. There's one other slightly larger bar, a, a, right. a Humbert Kellogg Humbert bar. Uh, so this is really the second largest bar known to exist, and it was taken off that shipwreck uh, uh, that happened in 1857 by the Thompson crew. But uh, so to answer your question about, okay, how do you figure this? So the melt value on on this bar is one and a half, you know, over one and a half million dollars. So how much of a premium do collectors place on uh, on on bars? As you pointed out, we've sold a lot of ingots over the years, uh, lots of them, some of them quite large, hundreds of uh, hundreds of ounces, a couple hundred ounces, hundred ounces, um, uh, oftentimes. And usually there's some measure two to four times uh, the gold price is sort of the premium that these go for. But when you talk about a bar like this, that's really unusual. Uh, uh, and truly a trophy among ingot hunters, uh, given the size, uh, we could definitely see a much larger multiple uh, on this, uh, on an item like this, uh, even though it is already expensive. Well, that's a question, right? You know, I know the, the, the larger one, the, the largest one sold for $8 million, I believe. Yeah, uh, that's uh, the reported sale. Yeah, I don't believe right. that was an auction, right. But what I'm fascinated by is what it, this is one of those things that you buy for the story and you buy for the history. It, it's narrative, whether it's the fact that it began as part of the gold rush, whether it it ended with a, the man who found it still spending time behind bars on his own because he uh, because of his running with the feds on other issues uh, involving that shipwreck. I mean, and, and everything it has to tell in between. When we talk about trophies, is there to your mind, any trophy more sort of significant uh, in fun or in anything that you know of uh, upcoming than this particular gold bar? You know, we all, I, I don't know if I can even answer that yeah. because we all, everyone in numismatics uh, has their favorite holy grail, uh, yeah. their, uh, their, their greatest coin. I don't think there's any uh, general consensus as to what the greatest item is to own or what, what the greatest trophy is. Um, people can make compelling arguments uh, about why even not even super expensive coins might be their, uh, uh, their, their holy grail uh, that they're going after. This ingot piece uh, is going to enjoy demand from a, a number of different sectors of uh, collecting. I think, trophy yeah. Hunters, yeah, trophy hunters, of course, but territorial hunters, uh, um, uh, gold precious metal buyers, okay, are going to be drawn to this. It's, it's, a, it's a great, cool thing to own. And uh, 
there's obviously a lot of wealth right now in the world, certainly in this country, and a lot of wealth uh, that we're enjoying in our collectible uh, hobbies these days. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to see this item uh, uh, sell for much higher multiples than we ever thought. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at, that, that, that this is not simply, you know, certainly the first coin minted, uh, everything we offer has a story to tell. But there is just something about this, and I and I guess it, it it becomes right. This is that's what makes us all collectors. Everybody who works here is a collector for a very particular reason. Either you love the artist, or you love that comic book. It meant something to you as a kid. That was your favorite baseball player. When I look at something like this, and I guess it's having told the story of it, uh, having had the opportunity to tell the story. But what makes it fascinating to me is the story itself. This has been written about in books. You know, when it was found, it looked like it was something right out of a movie. The, just the fact that this disappeared under the ocean for 130 years, that this spent, a, you know, over a century in the Atlantic Ocean is just kind of a remarkable tale all, all on its own. Um, well, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to be uh, sending you over a bitter card. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I hope you're also sending over a, a larger paycheck. Uh, uh, happy to do that. And uh, uh you know, we have payment programs here. So, you know, you just you just let me know whatever it takes to uh, uh, to get you bidding on this. The one thing I love about working here is the fact that I can just look at it. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly fun. Uh, Tommy, if you don't mind pulling Larry's question back up, I certainly don't want to uh, don't want to ignore it. Larry asks, uh, I think this is a great question because uh, it sort of gets to some of the, the finer details of what we're talking about here. Larry says, I'd love to hear your th sentiments on the third party grading com companies. Is PCGS still number one? Is ANACS respectable? I feel NGC routinely overgrades and ANACS irritatingly undergrades. What are your thoughts, Todd? Interesting. Um, I don't see a lot of ANAX coins. Um, the ones that I have seem to be sort of hit and miss. Uh, certain ones that I see, I think that they're spot on on the grade and the same that PCGS or NGC would certify a coin. Other times I think they might miss something. Um, you know, as for PCGS and NGC, they both sort of have their their area in the marketplace. Uh, as you know, at Heritage, we buy and sell them um, uh, both uh, on a regular basis and um, uh, and in sort of equal numbers. PCGS coins continued in U.S. numismatics. Uh, PCGS coins continue to enjoy a bit of a premium over the same grade in an NGC holder. Uh, but that just allows you to maybe step up and buy a slightly higher grade in an NGC holder versus a lower grade in PCGS. So you really, I, I try not to look at certified companies as much as I like to look at the coin itself uh, and how I grade the coin itself. Um, you know, in uh, in a lot in ancient coins, for example, or in other uh, foreign areas, NGC has uh, seems to have some big advantages over PCGS. But we um, like we we do a lot of business with both companies. Uh, both companies have their role, and our our job here, when we get in a collection from a consigner, is to use the grading companies for grading or regrading. Uh, uh, whatever we can do to maximize the value for our consigners uh, when we present them for auction. Uh, so if we think something's going to go into a higher grade because one company uh, uh, tends to like this sort of a look on a coin more than another, well, our grading team will recommend that we should use that company uh, versus another. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you just have to look at the coin itself um, and uh, determine whether or not you agree with the printed grade with PCGS and NGC. While we're taking questions here, because that's what we're here to do, Gary wonders, what are your thoughts about classic commemoratives? That's <laughs> uh, it's a great question. As long as I've been involved in numismatics now, uh, I don't know, over over thirty five years, um, I've been pounding the table saying that I think classic commemorative issues, uh, silver commemoratives, and, and gold now are uh, among the most undervalued and underappreciated areas of collecting. They're not expensive coins. You're talking about buying coins that you can buy for $100 to a few thousand dollars at the most to put together a complete set in nice gem condition. Um, the uh, uh, And I thought they've been undervalued for so long. Now, I think we have seen some good price increases in the last year or two. 
uh, in a lot of areas. But I can tell you right now, for the previous 34 years, I've been wrong. Uh, the marketplace has continued to drift lower, and I just think that they keep becoming better and better buys. Uh, I, I think that maybe someday one of the larger direct marketing companies will probably start pushing these things, and we're going to see them rise to the price levels that they should. Uh, but I've just always thought it was a great area to collect. I, I think there, every coin has a great story to it. it they're all different. You know, when you collect a complete series of something, whether it's Indian cents, Walking Liberty abs, silver dollars, twenty dollar gold pieces, whatever, all the coins look, for the most part look alike. Uh, the, only the date and mint marks have changed. And uh, but in classic commemoratives, every single issue has a totally different uh, obverse and reverse uh, uh, design, and um, and uh, and sometimes significantly different rarities and vintages. I, I just think it's a neat place to collect and. Uh, uh, and it's an area that I think someday will, will have its day in the sun. Are there any other things that you think are undervalued at the moment that if you were to tell somebody right now, you should probably start buying this. And look, we always tell folks, buy what you love. Don't simply buy something because you think or you hope or you wish that its price will one day increase and you can put your kid through college or you can buy that dream house. But if there was a thing that like classic commemoratives that you believe to be undervalued at the moment, what would that be? I don't know if I do, if I see something right now. The marketplace yeah. has already enjoyed this a little bit of a spike in prices. If you had asked me this question a couple of years ago, I probably could have uh, more easily rattled off uh, areas to look at. For a long time, Lincoln cents seemed to have fallen out of fair, favor. I'm talking about some of the rarer dates. Uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of a, a bounce back in that area. Uh, but I think that uh, a lot of those prices are still way off their highs. You could look at it that way. Um, you know, in terms of what's undervalued and what people should bid on, my answer is anything being offered in next month's sale. Uh, and uh, there's just uh, uh, it, it's really one of our best auctions ever. It, it, I don't think it'll be our largest uh, week of auctions ever. Uh, th that would be hard to beat over some of our previous years. But the breadth of material in in the various uh, catalogs uh, is really uh, is really impressive and does have something for everyone. So we go from a gold ingot, and I know there's a, some questions left, and we have a few minutes, and we'll get to those. But we go from that gold ingot that's uh, spent uh, over a century at the bottom of the ocean to the 1652 oak tree shelling. What's interesting for me, and I want to get to this discussion before we get out of here, which is about this comes from the Allen V. Weinberg collection. I want to talk to you about what makes a coin sometimes more valuable. Is it the date? Is it the rarity? Is it the condition? Or is it the fact that it comes from a significant collector's significant collection? That's a great lead in for this particular coin, because the reason I selected it, it's not the most expensive or the highest grade. Uh, I don't think it is anyways. Uh, colonial issue that's going to be offered uh, next month. But this particular one comes from a uh, collector by the name of Alan Weinberg. And um, <laughs> I, I haven't known Alan. Well, I've known of Alan for a really long time, and I've only gotten to really know him over the last few years. But this is a guy who, uh, and I seriously doubt he's listening to, to me today, but <laughs> right now, but this is, here's what's really great about buying from pedigreed uh, known collections like this. Ellen Weinberg, and like a lot of, like Bob Simpson, uh, like uh, the Arizona collector, like the Ryan's Bequest collector. Um, these are guys that, ex that exercise such a high level of connoisseurship when they were acquiring these coins. They've really eliminated so much of the guesswork uh, or eliminated um, uh, any doubts that you might have as to whether or not this is a really great coin. Weinberg specialized, Mr. Weinberg specialized in uh, early colonial issues and also some metals, uh, uh, more modern metals. But the uh, every coin that this guy selected, he agonized over. Uh, this is uh, just your, your consummate professional, your consummate connoisseur that... Uh, probably passed on two or three coins that might even have been certified at a higher grade, but he bought this coin because he thought it was better in, in some way and that the grading companies were missing something. Uh, and in many cases, uh, uh, Mr. Weinberg's correct. Uh, over time, a lot of his coins upgraded uh, at services uh, from when he first bought it. Anyway, uh, like I said, it's not just uh, it's not just Mr. Weinberg, but it's really a number of the collectors uh, that have consigned coins to our sales that are in main collections, featured collections. Well, it's interesting, right? Because, you, you know, 
And, and, and as we wrap it up, I don't think we're going to get to every single coin you and I were hoping to discuss because uh, there are a lot. It's, it's certainly, as you say, one of the best uh, auctions we've had in a very long time. Uh, certainly one of the most diverse, whether it's the Peterson collection. But I want to talk to you about the Simpson collection because I believe seven, the seventh part of the ongoing Bob Simpson collection is going to be taking place. I got to spend time with him last year with you. Uh, as we began uh, auctioning off Bob Simpson's coins. And so far, I believe, and I, I, I may be off by a million or two, but I think it's $77 million so far from the Simpson collection. That's um, correct. And to me, what's fascinating is what he spoke to us last year about the fact that he would buy a coin that wasn't necessarily, if he thought a coin was better looking and a lower grade, he would buy that coin. For him, it was about eye appeal. Yeah, it was. And, and it was for like uh, Mr. Weinberg and a lot of other collectors that have really turned out to be uh, uh, among the most successful collectors financially over the years. Um, these are people that really have a great artistic eye. They probably would have been people like Simpson, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Weinberg, uh, uh, a lot of other, uh, the other collectors uh, that are really known collectors, the Steve Duckers of the world. Um, Elias Briggs. These are guys that probably could have been very successful in uh, in any other area of collecting, manuscripts, artwork, perhaps, uh, because they've just got this innate, really good eye. And I think a lot of coin collectors are like that. They develop a really keen sense to what's beautiful. Uh, how great is the luster on this piece compared to others? And uh, those are the ones that I see go on being the most successful. Um, as we go into um, uh, Mr. Simpson's collection. Once again, he's given us a number of coins to offer without reserve. Uh, so everything is going to sell. Uh, in fact, everything in the Ryan's Bequest collection, the Arizona collection, the vast majority of coins in platinum I will all be offered without reserve. So there's really not much guesswork there. They're going to go for whatever, whatever they were worth that particular day. Um, but for Mr. Simpson's collection, you just pulled up that 1796 uh, quarter. That's one of the classic numismatic rarities uh, in, the, in the business. Um, and it just has this amazing cobalt blue color, uh, just absolutely spectacular looking. And uh, the 7096 is the first year of issue for 25 cent pieces. Uh, and historic, there it is. Uh, and the image on, that we have on this, it's really hard to, it's deeply toned. That's sometimes hard for our imagers to capture. But this one has this iridescent cobalt blue that just shines. And when you put it under some light, it, the, the colors really dance. It's a, a gorgeous piece. Um, I saw right before that you had up the $17.95, $10 piece. This is a near, um, a really great choice example of a $17.95, $10. First year of issue for uh, for gold coinage uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, the $10 piece, largest denomination. We didn't start making the larger $20 pieces until uh, uh, 1840, 1839. But, you know, Todd, when you see that the bid on that coin is already $350,000 with several weeks to go, what does that tell you about how well that coin will do and the expectations for it? Because clearly that says to me, this is something people really, really are going to want to own. Well, I don't know how much longer you're going to allow me to talk about it. You're touching on a topic that I could talk about for a long time. Go ahead. We, well, we've seen. So to answer your, you ask a great question about, okay, so the fact that it's already at three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, and it's still weeks before the sale, how does that? Uh, what does that indicate to me as to what it's going to sell for? My answer is I, I still don't know, and here's why. There, are, I'll bet you there's another coin. Uh, well, for example, pull back up the previous uh, coin, Tommy, if you would, the seventeen ninety six quarter. What's that bid at? Now, okay, so that's already up to four hundred and thirty. Yeah, that's going to go further. Um, I'm trying to, th my point is that there's probably another coin from Mr. Simpson's collection that I expect to sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars that is currently bid $8,000. So just because these are already bid at hundreds of thousands of dollars versus others that aren't, um, uh, there's a good one. That's going to go for a lot more. But um, we've seen this real shift, uh, this dynamic shift in how the psychology of bidding. When I first came to Heritage, um, uh, people would uh, often bid on the internet and prior to going the day before going into the live session, Robert, uh, uh, most of our coins were already bid to uh, probably 80, 90% of what we expected them to be at. Um, and it was fine. It was within striking distance. Uh, so our consigners were calm and happy. 
those of us that watch the auctions for strength, uh, we're okay. We're within striking distance of where we expect to be. So it's going to be fine. But then when Heritage introduced the uh, uh, HA Live, uh, the live streaming where you can literally bid from the comfort of your house, your plane, your wherever you are, you know, as long as you've got an internet connection, you can bid live as if you're right in the room. We started seeing this shift where nobody bid early anymore. Uh, and and, and it, if I'm advising somebody to bid, I don't usually tell them to bid early. Uh, I tell them, don't show your hand, hold back, you know, and then just bid uh, as close to the live session as you can or in the live session. Uh, as much as I prefer people to bid early, bid often. But uh, where we saw this shift was um, going in the day before the live sale now, rather than the coins already being bid to 80 or 90%, the coins are at 50%, 60, 70% maybe of where we expected them to be. So it's caused, a, it, it caused a lot of consigner angst uh, and also wreaked havoc for those of us monitoring the auction, thinking, you know, how weak is the marketplace right now? You know, this, is, this could be trouble. Time and time again, we'd see bidders deliver and the coin would still end up bringing a very satisfactory price. Uh, we've just seen this this uh, this shift in how people like to bid today. And now people, because we've made it so easy to be in the live auction. It's one of the things about the pandemic that really helped Heritage more so than a lot of other companies is because we had invested millions of dollars into our online bidding platform uh, and in the live live platform so that it makes it really easy uh, and fun for people to bid live uh, right in the live auction. And they're confident that their bids are going to get executed correctly. And uh, as that became more and more, or people became more and more confident in that type of bidding, that's how most people bid today, where we can conduct a, a, literally a 60, $65 million rare coin sale next month. Um, it, it probably would be just as successful as if we were conducting it, you know, uh, somewhere in the middle of winter in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, as if uh, in the major in the middle of a major uh, coin convention in Orlando. Right. Tommy, I know there was at least one question about Masonic coins that I uh, glossed over as we were discussing a few other things. Gail wants to know, uh, or old Masonic coins, is there any value there? Yeah, there are. Um, like every series of collecting coins, so Masonic I, I'll confess right up front, concede that uh, I'm not an expert in this area of numismatics at all. It's a really specialized area. A couple of my catalogers um, uh, are pretty attuned at it, and they're they're good when I ask them these sort of questions. Masonic coinage is a pretty esoteric area of numismatics. Not a lot of people know about them. There's not a lot written about them. They're not real mainstream. But within that series, like every series uh, of uh, coinage, there's always a handful of them that are actually very that are quite rare and valuable uh, and interesting, whereas a lot of the other ones are not particularly uh, rare and uh, uh, they don't bring much money in auction. Uh, but there's always those key dates that do. So the best way to find that out would be to send us uh, an image uh, of the of the item. Uh, and this goes for any anybody who has coins. Send us as, as good of an image as you possibly can. And we'll try to identify it for you and give you an estimate. Maybe it's only worth a couple dollars you know, maybe it turns out to be something really valuable. Another question. Are you seeing any gems in the Morgan Dollar Series coming soon to auction? You know, it's been a little while since we've seen an amazing collection of silver dollars um, uh, come uh, uh, come for sale. I think that right now the people that are collecting dollars seem to be in pretty strong hands. And we just haven't seen any really significant collections. There's, the, uh, there's always going to be the occasional gem piece. Uh, unfortunately, not an 89cc or 93s, one of the key dates to the series. But um, uh, even without looking at the catalog, I'm sure there's going to be a handful of uh, really tough dates in, in gem condition. Um, but right now, uh, the silver dollar collectors, they seem to be in pretty strong hands that don't show much, in, uh, much indication of bringing them to market. Fred asks or says, I have a complete two and a half dollar Indian collection NGC, most being CAC, including both key dates. Is it worth my time to upgrade the few to CAC or should I trade this to a single coin in the 50 to one hundred thousand dollar level? Well, it's all relative value. Um, it depends on what that coin is that you're trading and exactly how much uh, how much you're going to be trading it for. Um, I might look at that and say, no, you're better off keeping the, the two and a half dollar set and continuing to build on that. Or, um, uh, or yeah, this would be great if you can trade these straight across for that item. 
value is value. Uh, you just have to be a little more specific for me to answer that sort of a question. But I will tell you, it's a question that I get asked, this type of question, I get asked it a lot, Robert. Um, and uh, uh, literally not a day goes by that I don't have multiple uh, questions from collectors asking me, hey, listen, I'm thinking about selling this and buying that. You know, what do you think? You'll always get my candid opinion and not just mine, but my colleagues. I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really experienced and uh, smart numismatic traders that that buy and sell coins all day long. And we're always happy to share our opinions uh, about such things. Well, Fred uh, asks, does it matter if they're all two and a half, uh, if all the two and a half dollars are MS64? No, not necessarily. Again, value is value. Um, you know, there's big premiums being paid for CAC coinage. And in some cases, I understand that premium. In other areas, the premium that's paid uh, because the coin has a CAC sticker seems a little bit more unreasonable to me. And I don't think I'm saying anything that John Albanese, the uh, the head of CAC, would tell you the same the same thing. And that is that um, some of the premiums that are paid for coins with CAC stickers is definitely uh, warranted and, and fine to pay the premium. Other times, I'm sure that John, like me, and other uh, uh, other knowledgeable dealers shake their head and go, wow, you know, that, I don't know if that premium is going to get recovered or not. Uh, but uh, right now, there's such demand for CAC coins, and I don't see that uh, that waning anytime soon. Uh, John uh, has created a great product there uh, that everyone should pay attention to. Well, Todd, I've kept you for over an hour. I'm sure there may be some folks who thought about asking your question, but said, gosh, we should probably let that man go. If you have a question for Todd, feel free to email him at Todd at HA.com. Remember, fun is June, January 5th through 10th in Orlando. Uh, Orlando is always a delight any time of the year, or at least so I've been told. Absolutely. Todd, I appreciate you doing this. I hope you have a great Christmas and a, a wonderful new year. And, uh, yeah, happy holidays to, uh, to you, Robert, and uh, uh, to everyone. Thank you all for the support you've given our company over the years. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're in for another uh, uh, really interesting year in 2022 with a, a, a lot of newsworthy coins coming to market. Well, we look forward to that. I look forward to writing about them, and I look forward to hearing about them and maybe even holding a couple. Thanks, everyone. We'll do this again, uh, I think, uh, sometime after the beginning of the new year. If we do not see you until then, have a great holiday season, and thank you for everything. We'll see you shortly.